Now I get the pleasure of reading the Bible this morning. So we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9. It's the only book that we're going to be reading from this morning, so there's no bouncing around. I'll give you a minute to find it. Okay, Hebrews chapter 9, which starts out, Worship in the Earthly Tabernacle. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room there was a lampstand and the table and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. The ark contained the gold jar of manna, iron staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people that had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater, more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremoniously unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. He will cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when someone has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water scarlet wool and branches of hyssop and sprinkled the scroll and all the people and he said this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies in fact the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. 
then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is just just destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time, not to be a sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Amen. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. Sorry for the, the stitch up with the very long Bible reading there. I, um, the honest truth is, I, I, this passage is so rich and wonderful and I couldn't choose what to leave out. And this is our chance to look at it this week. And so we're doing it. We're going for Hebrews 9. And it is an incredible part of God's word, uh, deep riches God has for us here. So let's, let's pray and then we'll dive into what I think is an extraordinary part of God's word. <clears throat> well, Father God, you are the giver of all good gifts. Every good thing we enjoy is from your hand. And Father, as those who know and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that there is none gift greater than the gift of your Son. And so this morning, Lord, we pray, please, that you would show us Jesus. Open our eyes to see the incredible thing, the Son of God, the cross of Christ, him crucified. I pray, Lord, that you'd cause us to have a deep appreciation a, a, a new a new hope and a new joy that is found in the cross of Christ. Please, Lord, grip us with these things, we pray this morning, for our good and for your glory. Amen. Well, remember COVID press conferences? You have to rewind the tape a bit in your head for this. That weird time in life a few years ago where each week or each day at sometimes, good old Gladys, she'd get up with her crew and she would hand down from on high the new rules for the week ahead. Now, I'm sorry if I'm triggering some of you, but this was a part of our lives. We all went through it. it you know, This week, you're allowed 10 people in your house, but no more than 20 different people on a given week. You can go outside for exercise. Walking is exercise, golf is exercise, sitting on a chair is not exercise. Uh, you can go to church, but you can't sing anymore. You can't go to church, but you can participate in religious care. Remember all this stuff that happened, all that? The COVID conferences. Now, all of that was just bizarre enough on its own, but imagine how bizarre it would have been if the New South Wales government suddenly got up and did all of that without COVID ever having happened at all. So imagine 2018, before any of the COVID stuff was happening, imagine if the Premier just got up one day in 2018 and just said, oh, good evening, New South Wales, from now on you are only allowed 10 people in your house, public gatherings are cancelled, and I'm going to ask all of you to wear masks when you go outside and social distance and all that, without the context of COVID, imagine doing that. (laughs) It would be beyond weird. It would, it would just be so arbitrary and bizarre. It would just be mind boggling. Well, here's the thing. Without the proper context in mind, that can be a little bit what Hebrews 9 feels like this morning. Without the critical context front and center to make sense of it, some of the details in this passage can seem a little bit a bit weird, a bit bizarre, a bit strange. Tabernacles and lampstands, consecrated bread, curtains, sacrifices, blood, holy places, all of it can seem quite bizarre if you're coming in cold to this. And in fact, Hebrews 9 is actually referring back to the Old Testament sacrificial system. And without the proper context in mind, well, the whole Old Testament can actually seem quite bizarre. What's going on with all of this? Have you ever read Leviticus? It's quite strange without the context in mind. But here's the thing, with clarity on the context, well, this passage this morning takes us right to the very heart of the most important question humanity has ever had to wrestle with. This couldn't be more important. I'm not exaggerating, it is that important. Now, what's the critical context to have in front of us as we dive in? Here it is, sin and the judgment of God. 
That's the context you have to have. First of all, sin. Did you see sin all over this passage as we went through all 28 verses there? It was everywhere. Verse 7, the priest offered blood for the sins of the people and for himself. Verse 13, we need to be sanctified, cleansed of our sin. Verse 14, we need to be cleansed of acts which lead to death. That's talking about sin. Verse 15, Jesus died as a ransom to set us free from sin. Verse 15, verse 16, Jesus does away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 28, Jesus bore our sin. And so writ large across this whole passage, at every twist and turn, is this big problem, sin. We are sinners. We've actively, willingly rebelled against our God. We've thrown him off. We, we fail to treat him right. And that is the very heart of sin, to throw off God. And so as a terrible byproduct of our throwing off of God, we fail to treat others right as well. Sin is what's front and centre here. It's the great shadow that actually hangs over the whole of the Old Testament, in fact. From Genesis 3 onwards, after the fall, sin is this great, this spectre, it's this blight, it's this shadow cast over the human problem. We've thrown off God. That's the problem. And the whole Old Covenant is written in response to this problem of sin. Now, the other context the judgment of an angry God. And the Bible's very clear, God is is not okay with our sin. He's not chill about it. He's not just going to shake it off. He takes it seriously and he'll hold us to account. Here's a strange question, but what is your destiny? Where are you headed in life? Well, look at verse 27 of our passage. This is some of the most sobering words in the whole Bible. Chapter 9, verse 27. People are destined to die once and after that face judgment. Now, I started by talking about the context of this passage, but really what we're dealing with here as you look closer is we're talking about the context of your life. (laughs) This is the context of your existence. This is the reality which every single person on the planet, Christian, interested in this stuff or not, lives their life in. Here is your destiny. One day you'll die. And everyone agrees with that. We all know that to be true, even if we don't like it and we don't like to think about it. Deep down, we know it's true. And the second sobering piece is after that, we will face judgment. Now, I know some people will say to that, how barbaric, how could God be like that? Or there is no God, we just die and rot, that's the end of it. But the clear and sobering teaching of the Bible, Jesus himself said this more than anyone else, Judgment is what follows death. God will hold us to account for how we've lived. He will weigh your life, your actions, the secret things, your very thoughts, and in particular, how you have treated him. He will judge. How, you, how will you fare on that day? Now, you might be sitting here going, man, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Whoa, what a start to the day. I reckon I'll do all right when that day comes. But sorry, what was the first piece of the context again? The second piece is judgment. The first piece is we are all sinners. (laughs) So two facts hang over us. We are sinners. We will face the judgment of God. Now, that's a very heavy start-up as we look at chapter 9 here together, but this is the context which hangs over this passage as God addresses us today in His Word. How can sinners stand before the judgment of a God who is rightly angry at our sin? Now, with that in mind, I'm convinced that the things God has for us in His Word here this morning are the single most important thing a person can wrestle with. And so let's look at this critical passage together. And first of all, see there in verses 1 to 10, that the Old Testament displays the great problem of humanity, the very thing I've just been talking about, in high definition. 
That's what the Old Testament does. See, verses 1 to 10 is a summary of the Old Testament sacrificial system, the temple system. And verses 1 to 5, it describes how the places were to be set up in the, in the tabernacle. Verses 6 to 10, it describes the temple worship that happened there. And so let's have a look at it together, because this is teaching us something really important. Look at verse 1. It says, now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary, a tabernacle was set up. Now, the tabernacle is like the the mobile tent version of the temple. It's the place where God's people, prior to the temple being built, it's the tent that was put up so that they could come and worship God, make their sacrifices there. Later on, they built a temple and did the same things there. Now, how is it set up? Well, verse 2, it kind of works from the outside in. So this is moving in closer and closer to the centre. Look at verse 2. In the first room, on the outside room, were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place, the, the holy place on the outside. Uh, Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place. As you move into the centre of this temple was this place called the Most Holy Place. This was the place which the Bible tells us is actually where the presence of God dwelt. Now you can see the details of how it was set up and what was in there, verses 4 and 5. But look down now to verses 6 to 10 and see what went on in this tabernacle. Have a look. In the outer room, oh, they did a whole bunch of ministry there, but in verse 7, the holiest holy place, verse 7, look what happened there. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins that the people had committed in ignorance. So you only entered the holiest of holy rooms in the centre of the temple once a year under strict conditions, and only the high priest would go in. And when he did, he went in with blood to cover his sin and the sins of the people. And so death and sacrifice and blood were at the heartbeat of Old Testament worship. Day after day, these sacrifices were made. Now, just think about your morning this morning for a moment. Think about your experience of coming to church. You know, you park in a nice car park, you find your way in past some nice gardens, maybe line up for a coffee on the way in, smiles and hellos and hugs to friendly people, we sing some songs, the kids are having a great time, we sit in some comfy chairs and think on some important things together. For the Old Testament people of God, the gathering of worship involved death, blood, throats slashed, animals' blood poured out, flesh burning, ashes sprinkled around. Imagine that for your normal Sunday morning experience. It'd be pretty different, wouldn't it? It'd be very different. Now, you might hear that description of Old Testament worship and go, well, what on earth, God? What the heck? What was God doing? Why would God ever want to be worshipped like that? Why all this blood? Why, why would God do such a thing? He instructed it. Why? Well, have a look down at verse 22. The answer's right there. It says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's what's at the center of all of this. Blood in the Bible symbolizes life. Blood spilt, blood poured out is, it's death. It's a life offered as All Old Testament worship, as you see the blood and all these details, it shows that sin deserves death. The consequences of human rebellion is is we deserve judgment. Blood offered is a death offered in the place of the worshipper. It's a sacrifice. And so all of this is addressing the big human problem, sin and the judgment of God. This is what it's about. And as you'll, as you'll see as we read on, this wasn't just an Old Testament thing either. It's not as if over time God kind of became more woke and said, don't worry about all that judgment and sin stuff and don't worry about it later on in the New Testament. I'm fine with it. That's not what happened. <laughs> now, as you look at these details here in verses 1 to 10, why all this distance? Why an outside room before you come into the holy room? Why is God's presence only in the holiest of holy places in the centre, in the second room? And why only one person a year could they go in and encounter God there and only through blood? Well, again, the answer is judgment. 
the holiness of God, who will not tolerate sinners in his presence. That's what all of this is teaching us. And so verses 1 to 7, this whole system, in fact, the whole Old Testament sacrificial system is showing us our sin and the holiness of God, that he will not tolerate sin. It shows us our inability to approach him, to just stroll into his presence. You can't do that. All of this is screaming out the great problem of humanity, our inability to stand before God. And so as we step back and think about this Old Testament sacrificial system, did it work? Did this actually work? Well, I want to say yes and no. Let me explain. First of all, no, it didn't completely deal with the problem. Have a look midway through verse 9. It says that the gifts and the sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. They're only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. So that's saying there that this Old Testament system, it was inadequate. It didn't work. It made people ceremonially clean. It ticks the box of external religious regulation, but it says it failed to cleanse the conscience of the worshipper. It did do something. There was a sense in which genuine forgiveness was offered by God, but still the conscience of the worshipper was stained. The ongoing problem of sin remained. It didn't work. It didn't fully and finally remove the guilt of sin. And yet, notice that it did work as well. It actually did work because it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Have a look at Verse 9, this is really interesting. Verse 9, by all of this, the Holy Spirit was showing that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, showing that it didn't work. (laughs) And so God is actually teaching us today something profound through all of this, He's teaching us that the way through to God had not yet been revealed. And so precisely because the Old Testament system didn't fully cover sin, it didn't finally work, it was doing the very thing it was meant to do. It was teaching us that you need another way. It was showing us our great need for Jesus. That's what the Old Covenant does. Now, have you ever wondered, why did God bother with this old covenant thing in the first place? You know, last week, Dave took us through chapter 8, and at the end of chapter 8, verse 13, it says that the old covenant is obsolete, outdated, and will soon disappear. And you're like, well, that sounds like a waste of time. Why did God do that in the first place? Why not just jump straight to Jesus? Wouldn't that be better? Well, the answer is God was carefully and painstakingly teaching teaching the people of the Old Testament, but teaching us, you need Jesus. That's the lesson of the Old Testament. You will fail on your own. You will not keep the terms of this covenant such that you are going to be good with God and no amount of animal death and temple worship is going to cut it. That's the lesson. Now, I wonder if you hear all of this. As a Christian today, I wonder if you're still sitting there going... So if that's true and it's obsolete now, well, as a Christian who knows Jesus, why should I bother to read the Old Covenant, the laws, the Leviticus, all this Old Testament stuff? Why is it still in our Bibles today if it's now obsolete? What's the point? Why bother to read Leviticus when you could be reading Romans or something like that? I don't know if that's your question. Well, the answer is simple. They both show us Jesus. They're both about Jesus. Leviticus screams out your need for the Saviour, you're sinful, you're lost, come to Jesus. Even the architecture of the tabernacle itself shows you your need for the Saviour. And so just like the book of Romans shows us Jesus in plain English, as you read it there, Leviticus, by way of contrast and illustration, does exactly the same thing. It teaches us Jesus and it reveals the character of our great God. And so Christians, 
cherish and read your Old and New Testament because they're both about Jesus. Now, here's the second thing to see today, and this really is going to be the rest of the passage, okay? Here it is. I want you to see Jesus, the solution to humanity's great problem, because Jesus is better in every way. Now, we're going to move really quickly here, so stick with me, get set for this, but here it is. Jesus is the solution. He is better in three ways we're going to see. First of all, Jesus brings better access into the presence of God. Now, remember verses 1 to 3, talking about the tabernacle and then the temple. is this amazing building built by humans. Now, amazingly, the Bible does say that in a real way, God did condescend to be present in the inner room of the tabernacle. He did that. That's the thing that happened. Not that God was stuck or contained and constrained in a building or something like that. God is spirit. He's everywhere. You can't put him in a room and confine him there. But there was an appearing of his presence which remained in the temple such that God's people really could go into the holies of holies with blood and encounter God there. And that's actually amazing, incredible thing that God did. But what I want you to see is that that's got nothing on what Jesus does. Have a look at the contrast in verse 11. But when Jesus came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not a part of this creation. So this is saying Jesus approached approached God in a greater, more perfect tabernacle. And it's one that you can't make with your hands. You can't build it out of canvas. It's not a part of this world. And so what's that talking about? What, where did Jesus go to approach God? Well, look at verse 24, you get more info there. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands, that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. And so unlike a priest from the Old Testament who approached God in a man-made temple or a building that was made, Jesus approached God again for us as a high priest, but he does it in the very throne room of heaven. Heaven itself, the, the unfiltered presence of God, Jesus appears before God in the throne room of heaven and he does that as our high priest the one who intercedes for us. Now, if you remember back in chapter 4 of Hebrews, which we saw a few terms ago, because Jesus is our high priest, chapter 4, verse 14 to 16, he's now in the presence of God in the throne room of heaven. The implications of that is that we too can now approach God in Christ. Because Jesus is in the throne room of heaven, he is the one who brings us into the presence of God. And so the writer says, because of all of that, draw near to God, draw near to him. This Old Testament system, it allowed people to approach God in some manner through the Old Testament temple. Jesus means we can approach God in heaven itself. Now, as we draw near in prayer to him by the blood of Christ, But very literally, one day, face to face, we will be with him in heaven. Do you see how profound a privilege that is as a Christian? Verse 24 says that the the, the temple, the tabernacle, that's just a copy of heaven itself. Think of Chinatown. You could go to Sydney, you could visit Chinatown, you could eat some good Chinese food and I don't don't know if you can still buy fireworks there, maybe you could go to the markets, all that kind of stuff. And it's okay, right? Chinatown's okay, (laughs) but it's not China. (laughs) Going to China is a whole other... Chinatown is just a copy of the real thing, China. doesn't even come close to the glory of travelling there. Likewise, the temple, this access to God, well, it's just a copy of the reality which is in the throne room of heaven, where we Christians have privilege to come into the presence of God. And so it's no coincidence, isn't it, that as Jesus died on the cross, do you remember what happened in the temple when Jesus died? 
In the physical temple, there was this giant curtain hanging which separated the outer room from the inner room. And as Jesus died on the cross, we're told in the scriptures that the temple curtain was torn, not from bottom to top as if a man has torn it down, but actually from top to bottom. This giant barrier, this keep out sign was ripped down, declaring that the way to God is now open. We can come in to God. And so Christian... In Jesus, you have full access to God. Which also means this, friends, you don't need a whole bunch of other second-rate substitutes to draw near to God. Some mistakes you could make here. You do not need a priest or a temple to draw near to God. You know, some people say, yeah, Jesus, he brings me to God, but I also need a special holy building and a church that looks all amazing and, and a priest and some bells and whistles and fancy clothes. And, and somehow if I participate in this religious stuff, then that's going to bring me into the presence of God. No, <laughs> it's done in Jesus. And so you don't need a priest or a temple or any of that to come to God. It is done in Jesus. Now, if you hear me saying that and you feel like I'm having a go at the traditional church here as we sit in a modern looking church well let me give that same treatment to the modern church as well brothers and sisters we do not come into the presence of God through the experience of worship and music that is not the means by which we come into the presence of God much of modern Christianity is full of this error we are told you praise your way into the presence of God no (laughs) no We're in the very presence of God in Christ Jesus. And so it is finished. It's done. And so because of the wonderful rock solid reality secured in Christ, we praise God because he has brought us into the presence of God in Christ Jesus. And so praise is the response to the finished work of Christ, not the means by which we approach God which should give us, the people of God, more more reason than anyone to be full of joyful and loud praise to God. Singing is great, it's wonderful, what a gift. Just know why you're doing it. Because we can and have approached God in Christ Jesus. Now, likewise, still, you might hear all of that, two different expressions of church, and go, yeah, amen, man, this organised church thing, it's, it's, it's not really for me, I'm, I'm here today, sure, I guess, but I, I like to connect with God in nature, you might say. That's where I experience the presence of God, in His good creation. I go and commune with God in nature. Well, you know where I'm heading, don't you? Again, can I remind us, you don't come into the presence of God in nature, Now, creation, it may cause you to see the works of his hands and give him glory. Oh, amen. Go and watch a sunset, give God the glory. Love it. God's good creation may even help remove distractions. So you might go for a bushwalk and ditch the phone, leave it behind. Really good. But it's good so that you might admire the beauty of God's creation and meditate more clearly on the work of Christ who has brought you into the presence of God. Jesus connects you to God, not not nature, such that you could be sitting on a busy, gross, crowded train at Central Station on the way to work, and you are every bit as in the presence of God as if you were standing on a majestic mountaintop on your own. That's the amazing wonder of the work of Jesus, our High Priest. And so the conclusion at the end of this section that we're working our way through, chapter 10, verse 22, is with a clear conscience and full assurance, now draw near to God in Christ Jesus. That's the title of our whole series. Do you remember? Hebrews, draw near. That's what this is about. Because of Jesus, you can draw near. And so friends, (laughs) revel in this. Find your joy in this. This is everything. Come to God in Christ Jesus. What a treasure. That's the first way in which Jesus is so much better. But all of this does beg a question, I think. How does Jesus, how exactly does Jesus bring us into the presence of God? We've seen what he does, but how does he do it? Well, the next two show us the way. Second, better blood. Jesus offers better blood that truly washes away sin. 
Now, remember the Old Testament system back in chapter 9, verse 7, the blood of goats and bulls, it, it, it brought them into the sanctuary, but verse 9, it, it couldn't clear the conscience of the worshipper. Look now at the difference that Jesus makes, verse 12. Jesus, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. And so Jesus' blood is better. It brings eternal redemption. Now, redemption was the the everyday language of the slave market. Uh, Back in the time when this was written, where slaves were bought and sold in the market, you could go to the market and you could redeem a slave. You pay money and free them from slavery. Jesus pays with his blood and he eternally frees us from sin and the judgment of God. And so read on it, the implications, verse 13, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they're outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, how much more will that cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Do you see the great comparison there? Jesus' blood does so much more. How much more does it do? It fully cleanses our consciences. It wipes it away. And notice as well how Jesus does this. Verse uh, 14, the NIV says, he offered himself through the eternal spirit. Now, people debate what that means, offered by the eternal spirit. Is, is it saying he was offered up by the Holy Spirit? No, it could be that. The phrase being translated there, eternal spirit, is the word eternal pneuma, okay? It's a really broad Greek word. It, it means spirit, it means being, it means inner person, the inner will. I think the emphasis here isn't about the, the Holy Spirit of God. I think it's talking about the, the fact that Jesus... He was a willful offering of himself by the eternal will of God, which was Jesus' will. He was offered up by the eternal plan, by the eternal will of God himself. Jesus was offered. And unlike the blood of goats and bulls, who were offered against their will, if you like. You know, you don't, you don't see the goats lining up on the way into the temple like me first. No, no, they're just dragged in there. Unlike the animals against their will, Jesus willingly was the perfect, unblemished sacrifice, whose blood is of infinite worth, able to pay for infinite sin. And so verse 14, our conscience is clear. Sin is gone. <laughs> Guilt removed once for all. Now, this is a a really crass illustration for something so profound, so please forgive me in advance. But have you ever seen what a good pressure washer can do? Have you seen this? This last month, I had to get my house ready for sale and I borrowed my dad's industrial pressure washer and I kind of went a little bit pressure washer crazy, to be honest. A normal hose, you could wash your driveway with it or something like that, wash down a fence and you're like, I cleaned it, I guess. Uh, But a pressure washer... My goodness, it's, it's like you're pressure washing your fence, the path, the driveway, the deck, I did everything. And you look at it and it's amazing. It's like a new driveway is reborn as every possible stain is torn away from the concrete. It's, it's a new thing that is born through a pressure washer. Well, the blood of bulls and, bulls and goats, it did something. It was God's way of approaching him in the tabernacle. But Jesus' blood is like a pressure washer for your soul. Conscience cleansed white as snow. It's hard to overstate how profound a gift this is. And in fact, the writer is so caught up on it that he goes on for another seven verses that I don't even have time to cover this morning. But here's the fact. Verse 22, without blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. Jesus' blood is the perfect blood willingly offered that brings perfect washing, perfect forgiveness. Now, amazingly, here's the thing. There's still one more glorious aspect that you've got to catch to all of this. Here it is. Here's the third thing. Jesus is better because he offers a better permanent sacrifice once for all. 
once for all done and dusted. See, look again at verse 24. Remember, Jesus entered heaven itself as our high priest, verse 24. But look at what he does there. Look at his ministry in verse 25. It says, nor did Jesus enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest entered the most holy place every year with blood that was not his own. Otherwise, Jesus would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And so he appears once for all, the perfect sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the high priest, they had to come time and time again back to the temple. Now, why? (laughs) Why did they have to do that? Well, whatever forgiveness could be offered through the blood of a, a bull... As soon as forgiveness was declared on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, as soon as that was done, what would happen the very next moment? There'd be more sin, a new stain, a new blemish, a a new, more blood would be needed, another life would be needed. The Old Testament system is like... It's like mowing the lawn. I'm very domestic today, aren't I? But, you know, you look at your lawn and it's all overgrown and messy and all that kind of stuff and you get out there on a Saturday morning and you cut it with your mower and you do the edges and you get the blower and you make your lawn look perfect and you stand back and go, ah, yes, it is finished for about a day until the weeds start growing up and all the mess comes again. Or it's like getting a haircut. Now, you might think that I'm saying that because I'm just trying to connect with those of you who are blessed such that you still need haircuts, but... I like haircuts more than anyone. In fact, I give myself two haircuts a week. It's just that I do it in the bathroom on my own with a razor. And what happens is I go and I, you know, cut all my hair back and it looks all good. And at the end of that, I look at myself in the mirror and I go, you've never looked better, Jono. And I walk out of that bathroom. But just as soon as that's done, you know what happens? That afternoon, I've got like a male pattern baldness five o'clock shadow that's already coming through. That's sin under the old covenant. Just as quickly as atonement could be made in the temple, the very next moment, the stain of sin returned. And so day after day, year after year, sacrifice after sacrifice. Not so with the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. This is a really big deal and he repeats this a bunch of times to make sure you get it. Verse 25, Jesus didn't enter heaven again and again to offer himself. Verse 26, he didn't have to suffer many times. Instead, he's done it once for all. And so look at how he finishes in verse 28. And so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he'll appear a second time, not to bear sin because he's already done that. It's done but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. And so Christ is the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice, and he's the perfect priest who offers the sacrifice, and he's done it once for all. So that as Jesus died on that cross, do you remember those last words? He cried out, it is finished. There is no more to be paid. It's done. And so all of this has staggering implications for our lives, doesn't it? Let me finish with some reflections on where this needs to land. First of all, Christians, your guilty conscience can be done away with permanently, completely. This is huge. What the blood of bulls and goats could never wash away, Jesus has. And so, friends, sinner... Your past does not need to haunt you anymore. Whatever regret, whatever guilt, whatever deep wrongs lay in the past for you, if you are in Christ, that is covered and paid for and done with. You may still live with the consequences in an earthly sense, but you are forgiven. It's washed away. Your past has been completely covered by the blood of Jesus. And friends, it even means this, still now, even in your sinful future, still you are secure in Christ, even in the future. 
Now, when I was a young follower of the Lord Jesus, I used to view the Christian life a little bit like this. I knew that I needed forgiveness for my past, okay? So I, I felt guilty about what I'd done. And I imagine that, you know, if, if this was the, where I was standing in the place of being out of God's good books, I was unforgiven, I was under the judgment of God, and I didn't want that anymore. And then I imagine that Jesus comes along and he pays my debt. And so he moves me from being in God's, you know, bad books over to here. And I imagine that I'm now forgiven by God. And I say, that's great. I've crossed over into this new category of being forgiven. <laughs> and then in my head, I imagined it was almost as if God was saying to me as a forgiven sinner, hey, you've been given a clean slate. I've cleaned you up from your sin. So don't you dare get yourself dirty again. That's what I imagined God was like. And, but the problem is I find myself with this clean slate. And do you know what would happen? Well, I would sin again and the guilt would return. And I'd find myself back in this place of feeling as though I was in God's bad books again. And I'd turn up to church trusting in Jesus, but I was riddled with guilt and fear about how God thought about me. I'd be weighed down and I'd come to church and then somehow if I repented and felt bad enough and trusted Jesus enough, slowly I would imagine that somehow I was going to get myself back into God's good books again for another week. As long as I didn't stuff it again the next week constantly jumping backwards and forwards between right with God, not right with God. That was how I lived the Christian life. But friends, do you see the beautiful mind-boggling implications of this passage? Jesus has paid for your sin once for all. So that when Jesus cleans you up and says you are forgiven, this is the position you are given And your standing with God will no longer depend on your performance. The bad week you had with alcohol or pornography or whatever it is, isn't going to plop you back down into God's bad books from now on. Jesus has washed us clean. We stay clean forever. And so praise God for that. Now, friends, if you're sitting here this morning, you don't know this Jesus and you don't know this forgiveness. Can I say to you this morning... You can make this your reality today. You could decide to do that today. Now, you could have metaphorically walked in those doors a sinner who's lost and under the judgment of God. You could walk in those doors and you could make a choice. You could decisively choose to put your trust in Jesus, repent of your sin, and you will cross over to being one. I'm sure I've gotten confused here with my left and right, but you cross over to being one who is forgiven now in Jesus permanently change category come to the place of forgiveness such that you will stay one who is forgiven in christ while ever your trust is in him you can make that choice today if you'd like now if you want to do that come and find me or another pastor pray with us if you don't want to do that go home close the door and pray to god yourself that's what's on offer in jesus and it's amazing and all of this finally means this friends we can have rock solid assurance of our salvation if you're in christ you can be sure of your destiny remember the start i talked about your destiny your destiny was to verse 27 die once and after that face judgment if you're in christ you can add one more thing to that list here it is die once face judgment and be declared not guilty safe in christ because of jesus And so as surely as one day you will die, so sure can you be that Jesus has paid for your sin and you will go to heaven with him. Praise God for what treasures are ours in Christ Jesus. Praise him for what treasures are on offer for those who come to him as well. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you for the great gift of your son. Lord, please help us to be in wonder at the forgiveness that is ours conscience is cleansed never to be made dirty again we thank you so much for the assurance for the the solid ground that is jesus and so lord looking away from ourselves and all of our efforts and all that we do we look only to him and we praise you and we thank you for the finished work of christ amen